Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation Institute for Performance Excellence webinar, The Impact of COVID-19 on the Future of Healthcare Leadership, a Baldridge CAMI Perspective. Here's today's agenda and featured guests. First, Dr. Roland Stacy, Program Director for Graduate Programs in Health Administration, University of Colorado, and Dr. Anthony Stanowski, President and CEO for the Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Management Education, Springhouse, Pennsylvania. Their presentations will be followed by questions from the audience and then a few closing remarks. Now it is a privilege to turn the presentation over to our guest panelists. Hey, well, thank you very much, Al. It's, uh, it's, it's an honor to kind of uh, to be here at the Baldridge Foundation session. Uh, my name is Anthony Stanowski. I am the president and CEO of CAMI. Uh, for those who, who don't know, CAMI is the Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Management Education. We were established back in 1989. And what we do is we actively promote, and we do that first by defining measurable competency-based criteria for excellence, supporting, assisting, and advising programs to attain that criteria, accrediting programs that meet that criteria, and making this information readily available to the public. So CAMI accreditation is the benchmark for students and employers alike and ensure that their students are well prepared to lead in healthcare. And the similarities between CAMI and Baldridge are really pretty self-evident at this point. Uh, CAMI overall is a community of scholars, educational, professional, clinical, and other health sector organizations devoted to quality improvement for education, for healthcare management and administration. Our mission is simple, advance the quality of healthcare management education globally. Uh, Rulin, I'm looking forward to an incredible session with you uh, within this Baldridge framework. Uh, thanks, Anthony, and welcome, everybody. I'm pleased to be on the, the webinar today with Anthony. I've known Anthony for years and am pleased to work with him in a, a different category now. I have been, for my career, the CEO of several different health systems and in 2009, I was the CEO of Poudre Valley Health System when we were fortunate enough to be designated as a recipient of that year's Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. And since that time, I've stayed engaged and uh, uh, having been the chair of the Board of Overseers a couple of times, now I'm on the foundation board. I've been working with the, the bio said Navigant Consulting. I'm actually with Guidehouse Consulting. I'm a partner with Guidehouse uh, Consulting on the, as well as the um, director of graduate programs of, in health administration at the University of Colorado, Denver. This program is a CAMI accredited program and it's given me a very unique perspective to see the, the similarities and, and uh, uh, the similarities between a CAMI accreditation and a Baldrige site visit, and there are many, and I'm looking forward to, to talking about that. It's given us a, a chance to evaluate what is happening um, a year ago and now what has changed, and that's what we're, we're trying to um, talk about today is what is different today that would cause Anthony and I to be invited by Al and his team to be on a webinar like this to try and explain how Baldridge and CAMI and leadership come together uh, like this. And so uh, Anthony and Al and I talked and we tried to find a way to um, understand what challenges the pandemic has given to, to educators and to practitioners and to students. Uh, and it's in, in keeping with the mission of the Baldridge Foundation and CAMI and and our university and trying to support these kinds of process development and, um, and, and performance um, improvement options. And so we have some goals collectively that we hope to be able to address today. First, we want, if, if we're successful, you'll understand the key management competencies that are most effective for ensuring the health of, com of a community during a pandemic. That's what we're trying, one of the first thing we're gonna try and do. And if we're successful, you'll understand what those competencies are. 
You'll understand how healthcare management educators can prepare students for a post-COVID world by using the impact of this, this pandemic in class materials. One of the things that Cami is very rigid on, rigid is the wrong term. I'm going through a site visit right now, so I'm a little overly sensitive. Um, that the, the, it's important to them that we can demonstrate that, that what is relevant in the industry today is what we're teaching our students today. Because other than that, what's the point? And if we can't prove it, as we all know in Baldridge, then you might as well not do it if you can't prove you're doing it. And the third thing is that we wanna discuss how management programs uh, like mine will change relative to COVID and uh, what some of the things we're doing. And, and we wanna understand how we can change future leaders going forward. So that's our goal and I'll let Anthony get cracking. Thanks Roland. It, it is great to work with you again in, the, in this situation too. Uh, really appreciate it. So um, what, what Cami did back in April, 2021, was we created a short survey that we did with academic leaders around the globe. And we participated with a couple of organizations to kind of make this happen. One of them is the International Hospital Federation. The second one is the European Health Management Association. We used the CAMI list as well. And we supplemented that by doing some in-depth research about healthcare management programs around the world and added to it. And then we also worked with the Association of University Programs and Health Administration. So all together, we received 229 responses representing people from 150 universities in 20 countries around the globe. Now, now look, this isn't meant to be a strong scientific survey and random sampling and all the rest. It was, here's the people we want to talk to. And our, our folks, our focus on here was try to really get a sense of how things are moving relative to healthcare management education. So um, the image that you see here shows the countries that we receive responses from. And um, we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about what we've seen from them later. But what Ruan's going to talk about is a study that Col the University of Colorado did that in some ways supplements some information that we've seen. So Roland, do you want to describe that study? Yeah, I do. And it is interesting, Anthony, that it, it does supplement the, the work that you've done. And we, Anthony and I did not talk before this. And it's, it is interesting, some of the similarities between the study that our researchers have done and he's done. So several months ago, um, in an effort to, to try and find out uh, industry leading research relative to the climate, leadership climate, uh, the, the University of Colorado Denver created what we have called the Health Administration Research Consortium. And the Health Administration Research Consortium, which you can Google that Health Administration Research Consortium, and it will come up for uh, University of Colorado Denver. The director, Dr. Jibon Kuntia, uh, has always thought that, that we have an opportunity to make a difference in, in gathering primary data and making it available. And we did that in, in January and February. We reached out to hundreds and hundreds of health systems uh, that, were, that, that all totaled were over $100 billion in, in annual revenue and hundreds of thousands of employees. And we ask them about the climate today, post COVID into the, what we've called the new normal. Uh, what actually Dr. Kuntia has called, he, he coined the phrase of the new normal. What is the new normal for, for what we're, we're trying to accomplish? And the researchers gathered this, these data from CEOs around the country. Um, we worked with academicians, clinicians, uh, everyone that we could. And we've come up with some data that would suggest some things that we can expect in the near future. For example, we think we can expect hiring to increase in the next 12 months. There's no great mystery in that. Uh, it, it, things were, were uh, limited in the past 12 months. So we know that's going to go up. But what, what is interesting is we expect mergers and acquisitions to increase 
but we expect them to increase particularly in from community to academic centers. That's where we think we're going to see that. Uh, in 2020, information technology saw its long awaited acceptance. We, we've been working for my whole career, literally, to find a way to, to see where information technology would become a relevant topic. And in six months, we, it happened. It was, it's the most amazing thing. And now people expect it and we will never ever go back. And so in our systems climate study, we found some interesting data. And it was that more than 64% uh, of the two thirds of the CEOs in the country are concerned about what happens with the new normal. There's gonna be differences in the new normal that they had not expected. Only 35% of them think that those changes are gonna bring uh, opportunities to them. Although they do think there's revenue opportunities out there. There are, there are um, like the clinical opportunities are more restricted than the revenue opportunities, but there's gonna be ways for um, nearly half of the, the industry leaders think there's gonna be chances for us to find revenue in a way that we couldn't before. I, th I find that fascinating. All of these data, by the way, uh, we made a decision as the University of Colorado, uh, partly because I knew I would be on a, a call with Anthony and I'd have to justify this, but we, we could have kept this, this uh, internal and gotten many, many cool papers out of it. But Dr. Kuntia, to his credit, said, we need to make this available to everybody. So if you go on the website, all of these original data are available to everybody and you can access these and write your own papers. And uh, but they're all there to, to see. Anthony, uh, thanks, Ruin. And that that concept of leading through crisis is important. And on the, uh, the the next slide, what we did is we surveyed again that that survey that we did of global academic leaders, and we asked them what was the most important competency domain that was that you feel was most important for your students to to have great skills with to succeed during the, uh, during the pandemic. And worldwide, what we saw was critical thinking and analysis was felt to be the most important by about a third, management leadership by 29%, and then communication was third. So those were the three most important competency domains, so larger areas of competencies. Ruin, his study, the study he's going to talk about, will go into some of the more detail of those, of those. And what's, again, fascinating is how these two pieces of research really kind of intersect. So I would suggest that if, as we look at this pie chart that Anthony has, has listed from his study, you can see 35% uh, the competency of critical thinking and analysis was represented by 35% of his respondents. 29% leadership and management, and 15% communications. If we were to take those three and create subcategories to them, it's it's my study. So let's go to the next yeah. slide, and you can see um, where uh, where we came up that uh, we that the competencies from the pandemic include emotional stability when faced with extreme job demands. Uh, we. The, a, an effective leader has to be able to pivot priorities rapidly, adapt to new ways of doing things. One of the, the papers that we did out of this was with myself and a senior faculty member here by the name of Wayne Cassio, recommendations to boards on what to look for with leaders in a crisis and how, to, how you can tell if you've got the right person or how you prepare them even before the crisis. Self-evaluation becomes crucial uh, resiliency is measurable and mandatory. And, and uh, the CEOs we talked to were very keen on finding ways to do that. Um, understand how we can support the well being of those that, that, are, that the leader leads, models of healthy work habit, effectively communicates internal and external challenges, and inspiration. Leadership is about 
inspiration. And a lot of it is we've all had somebody you think, I, you know, I would follow that woman or that man up a hill into battle because I trust them. And that's a big deal. The next um, slide takes these and puts them into the um, three strategies that leaders would need to address. The first is the pandemic propelled transformative and disruptive powers of digitalization to the forefront. We are now where we've been working for, for um, decades, uh, we're there and it happened in six months. Patients demand now a personal care that was not available broadly and they demanded that, that because they were able to get it digitally in ways they never could personally. And it was really, but consumerism is, is increasing and will continue to increase. And we, we will not be permitted that the example I use a lot is uh, the taxi system in, in New York. You know, at, 10 years ago, a, a medallion in New York for a taxi was a million dollars. And today they're free, essentially, because um, consumers just got to a point where they, they, there was another option and we are not gonna take that abuse anymore. We, we all have our New York taxi stories. Well, that's happening to us. And 2020 was the year of the change for us. And so the question is now in healthcare, in general and leadership specifically, are you gonna be a taxi driver or an Uber driver? And where are you gonna go? And um, are you gonna be able to, one of the things is retaining skilled workforce. Um, it is, it, it's becoming increasingly um, important. So um, Anthony, I think you're gonna talk about the- I am. I'm yeah, well, and the interesting part here is you're talking, you, you hit on the three aspects of the strategies that current leaders need to address. Now, let's take a step back into the student world and the academic world. And what we can see um, on, the, on the next slide is 58% um, of programs that we surveyed, again, in this worldwide survey, said they were challenged in placing students in experiential learning situations. Now, a core part of, uh, of accreditation and a, and a core part of a lot of the uh, robust programs in healthcare management is giving students the ability to see some real world experiences, whether that would be internships, fellowships, residencies, some period of working in a health system environment. And whether that health system be Health, hospitals, healthcare provider end, or physician practice management, or pharmaceutical, or uh, insurance, whatever the real world situation would be. So 58% of the program said they were challenged in those areas. And go to the next slide, because what, what you also see in that is that, now this is a little complex slide to read, but how educators saw the changing modes of education occur because of the pandemic. So again, let me take a little time to explain this to you, a little complex. We tried to make it as easy as possible with some pretty graphics, but um, it doesn't always succeed. So we asked educators prior to the pandemic, how did you deliver your curriculum? And the, the highlighted 59% said face-to-face. So about 60% of all programs globally were providing education in a prim prim more, uh, primarily face-to-face -face environment, 59%. 17% were in this partial hybrid. Some of it was face-to-face, -face, some of it was online. And 24% said totally online. We deliver all of our curriculum totally online. During the pandemic, the middle three bars, you can see how the numbers switch. Not surprisingly, instead of 24% being all online, you saw the percentage of programs go up to 87%. We all know that, right? 87%, 11% went to some face-to-face, -face, some online, and only 1% of all programs surveyed said, hey, no matter what with the pandemic, we were still face-to-face. So we saw that change. Now, here's the fascinating part. Post-pandemic, how do the academic institutions see their modes changing? And what you see here 
is instead of 59% being face-to-face, -face, like it was pre-pandemic, primarily face-to-face, -face, we see that number go down to only about a third, 33%. And the uh, hybrid approach goes up from 17% to 40%, and the all online stays approximately about the same. So you can see how the education process kind of changed in here. Now, these two slides together, the one where we talked about experiential learning and some problems getting it, and number two, um, the fact that programs have kind of moved to online learning is, rep to me, represents a significant change. And here's my argument, and it's almost a little counterintuitive. Rather than saying, oh, those poor students, they weren't able to get that face-to-face -face experience. Oh, those poor students, they weren't able to get that experiential learning. They didn't get the education that they needed. I would rather say lucky students. They got an even better education, one that tested not just their ability to gain knowledge, but actually challenged their whole way of learning. What we see from some anecdotal uh, comments from people is, Students didn't have that real world experiential, I'm in the hospital, I'm going around to the rooms and kind of checking it. Instead, what they were doing was working remotely. Uh, we heard instances where students were working remotely with departments of health from state, county, federal levels and assisting in those areas. They were learning and they were applying their learning in different ways. And I think that's exciting. Um, Rulin? So if, if we can go to the next slide, we'll give you some, some uh, real world data that we've got that supports our experience at University of Colorado Denver is um, identical, interestingly enough, to what Anthony just reported. At, at. We're, we're going back to school in August, and but it's going to be more hybrid than we've done in the past. We're going to start face-to-face -face classes again. Um, but the CEOs are, uh, I, I believe what the CEOs think will actually help the students adjust to the new normal. The CEOs are thinking that, that the systems will have digital technologies and it's gonna help streamline the workflows. That puts what we're doing now with the students, yeah, that will help them provide that service um, in the new companies. 80% of CEOs confirm that digital technologies enable data-driven administration and clinical decision-making. You know, we've always said that the, the process for efficiency means that we centralize, um, it, we, we decentralize process and centralize decision-making and, uh, or reverse that, sorry. And, um, this allows that, that, that uh, competency to be developed in the students. 75% of CEOs plan to re-engineer their business functions. And we're going to need people, they are going to need people who are able to do that. 68% agree that digital technologies would play a significant role um, in, in helping the customer-oriented services. 61% believe that digital technologies will increase and 55% see the value of digital technology and in creating innovation. Uh, next slide. So interestingly enough, one of the changes that we saw is as the, the leaders are posed with this new normal, uh, we've seen CEOs, 80% in fact of CEOs believe that they're going to have to stay current on technology as a system. And the way to do that is the CEO is going to have to serve as the organizational champion. That is different. We, that in the past, that's been the CIO. That's a big change. And CEOs today, our data suggests are realize that for this to stay relevant, they're going to have to be the champion and we're going to have to have a meaningful digital internal strategy. Um, Measure 78% believe that defining and measuring success measures will, will lead to improved digital investment. And 72% believe that a clear vision of digital investments uh, 
will give them a competitive, a competitive advantage. So when, when Dr. Kuntia, who is, I'm, I'm just brilliant, and this whole Health Administration Research Consortium is his brainchild, uh, I'm just happy to help put it together. Uh, he, he surmised many of these things when we got this, but now we have the data to support it. And that's, it's meaningful as we can go through now and stratify all of those data to um, support these conclusions. So the next slide is, um, oh, Anthony, sorry, there was one more before me. So sorry, Anthony, go ahead. That's all right. Well, and I, I think, you know, what, what you led into with the last slide and what this will talk about and then what you'll talk about from, from the research that you did too, those two together are really interesting. So what's the disruptive factor occurring within healthcare management education programs within higher ed? And what's the disruptive factor? What is that, what is that gonna look like in terms of healthcare providers too? And what's, what's interesting with this slide is we asked um, the academic uh, leaders out there, what was the impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, on the number of students that were in their program. And what we saw in here was interesting because, you know, again, a common, common sense knowledge would have been, oh, well, you know, programs all saw a significant decrease in the number of students and all programs are hurting. Well, that really wasn't the case. What we saw and what was reported to us is that 44% of programs said they really saw no change in their enrollment. And 17% uh, saw a decrease of more than 10%, and 14% saw a decrease of less than 10%. So about 31% saw some level of decrease. But look on the right side of the chart. 25% saw their enrollment increase, and a, a significant portion saw that increase more than 10%. And what Again, anecdotal evidence, what we've heard is that some of the major accredited programs saw their enrollment increase. And what they reported was that students said they wanted to come into the program. Um, they were inspired by what occurred in the pandemic and the leadership of some of the, um, the folks in the medical profession around that really inspired them to go into this field and they increased those programs increased their enrollment as they um, as the students sought to gain knowledge um, that they would actually spend this part of this year working to understand how to make a difference and uh, I, I think that was pretty significant uh, you know I know Ruland's uh, program saw it and one of the fascinating ones that that we've seen and, and can be featured on, a, on another webinar was Johns Hopkins University, which saw enrollment increase partially due to the fact that Johns Hopkins was the source of all the uh, data going on about the coronavirus. So it was fascinating to kind of watch this change and this occur both anecdotal and, and through some statistics. So Roland, why don't you take us so, through? So, the, uh, go ahead. so it, interestingly enough, Anthony, if I might just add a little bit to that. I, because we did see that, and I do have some, some data. Our, if we take our residential campus program, we've got an executive program and a campus program that our, in, in August of 2020, our program saw an increase of 14% over August of 2019. So right in the middle of the pandemic, and our cohort in the executive program that started in January of 2020 saw an 18% increase ish in um, the registrations. So for and I'm I'm interested to look at the data that you've provided there and correlate that with our study too. You know, about the same percentage of CEOs think, oh yeah, there's lots of opportunities for us here. Well, for the good ones, there are lots of opportunities. And for the ones who aren't doing it right, if, if you're CAMI accredited, I think you're doing it right. And you're gonna have, have the right opportunities, which is what I think leadership is, is all about. So sorry to get off track there, but okay, let's go to the next slide. And 
um, let me talk about some of the disruptions that that we're going to see and that we're based on this these data what we're going to prepare our students for and how we think we're going to make them you, you can you can see them now in fact I, I won't go into to much of these you can see these now and the, it will be recorded but the behavior models are going to change insurance models are going to change um, health tourism not as much as we thought uh, next slide Uh, what do we have to do to adapt to that? We've got to find the right workforce. That leads directly to educational programs like this one being able to, to identify that. So one of the things that, that we're doing, um, just as an example, and if you were to go to, I, I've, I was on faculty at uh, University of, of Minnesota MHA before I came here. And, and so when I talk about this program here, I don't mean to be inclusive. Those people at Minnesota, Jean and her team <laughs> are breathtaking. I want to be her when I grow up. That's what I want to be. In fact, I sent her a note that the other day and said, well, I just, can I just like be you? <laughs> and, but we're, we're trying to do everything we can to, um, to get there. And so, in the fall of this year, October, one of the things that we're trying to, to do to help find out how to do this is, is the Health Administration Research Consortium with faculty members, including um, Dr. Cassio, Dr. Contia, Dr. Helton. Um, our friends, I, I've got some contacts with the research contingent at Guidehouse Consulting, which is just brilliant, including David Burek. Those three researchers are gonna come together and we're inviting CEOs from around the country to come in and work with those researchers so that we can look at these exact data and and find out if it's making that match if we are finding the right thing and then instantly adjust our curriculum for that so provide research and it's these kinds of things and that kind of research that's allowing us um, to do that and working with our private counterparts in guidehouse and and our private counterparts in in lots of health systems that are coming and others, it, it's gonna be pretty meaningful, but you can see some of the things that we're, we're trying to address. Um, next slide. I, I asked Anthony if we could add these at the end, just because it, I think, ties in why we're on this call with Al, as opposed to any of the other calls. We've, we've talked about a very complex problem here that includes a crisis uh, that hasn't happened in this country for literally 100 years. And it's a, a crisis that we're trying to work our way through from an educational component, from universities to helping with students, to helping practitioners. It's complex in so many ways. And, and the Baldrige criteria allows that to happen. This is a a picture from what Baldrige does, what Baldrige produces, and any organization, whether it's it's a, a university or whether it's a hospital or whether it's an oil company, what we try and do is get different departments. So if you look in the upper left-hand corner there, that, that's representative of different departments in your organization. If it's in a business school, it might be the accounting department or and the the finance department and the HR department. If it's a hospital, it could be the ER and the OB. You can just imagine. But any goal and what Baldridge does, as I would argue, and I'm happy to have this debate with anybody, is the single most effective operating system on earth today. The Baldridge criteria allows any organization to focus those in the right direction, develop early systemic approaches, getting people where it needs to go, then align those approaches, and then fully integrate those approaches going forward. That's what Baldrige does. You can imagine my surprise when I came to University of Colorado and found out that CAMI requires the same thing. We have to be aligned. I've, we have to have systemic, uh, systematic approaches. I have to be able to show CAMI how my advisory board made up of 
of local business leaders and my alumni board and my students and my faculty are all aligned toward the same goal. And why would you not wanna do that? I mean, that's, it's the right thing. And the process I go through is, this picture comes from Baldridge, but it could be Cami. And, but it, it's what good organizations do. Um, next slide. What I found is that as we implement this with organizations as from a, a cost perspective, and the inverse of this is true for quality, as Baldridge is implemented, the cost goes down and the quality goes up, but it allows us the sustainability to keep that when it's fully deployed. Cami does the same thing. Cami's, Cami's uh, 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 survey process is five years increments. And in that, that five years, you've, you have to demonstrate that you set up a process and you maintain that process and that those processes are fully integrated and fully deployed and that you're able to compare those uh, going forward. And it's, it's why these are so, I think, unique and why education has such a great opportunity. If you're CAMI accredited, you should be looking at certifying through at, at the Baldrige framework because you're, you're halfway there. And finally, the next phase, uh, just uh, the next slide, I'm sorry. No, yeah, th this one, a cautionary tale. This is um, invented by a friend of mine, Kate Goonan, who uh, literally wrote the book. And as you go through any organization, as you try and make improvements, it's easy to do nothing like you have at stage zero. As you try and improve, you're gonna have you're gonna try and change those arrows that were in the upper left-hand corner. Some of them are going this way and some of them are going this way. Doesn't mean anybody is going the wrong way. You're just going different ways. And anytime you try and get those aligned so they're going the same way, people are gonna be frustrated and they're gonna push back and they're gonna think you devalue them. And what leadership is, is sticking with that, moving that to, to improve long-term and sometimes organizations, in fact, a majority of the time, organizational leaders just think it's too hard. I can't do it and they give up. And, and that's what you see there in stage two is we just give up and we go. And, but as you continue to improve, you, you can develop those um, processes, become Baldridge and I would say CAMI worthy as you, as you move forward in that process. And uh, Kate and her team put together in this last slide, some characteristics of some leadership characteristics that we try and put with our, um, our students and our leaders and others that we go with. So um, that's my final thought, Anthony, I'll turn it to you for, for final thoughts on, on some of the things that I've said. Well, I, Ruan, I, I think that, that the fact that how the two studies we talked about really kind of worked together uh, to come up with very similar conclusions and perspectives. I think how um, the CAMI accreditation process and the Baldrige process are very similar in terms of a whole process improvement function that they, they really kind of serve is, is really fascinating. I, I wanna kind of point out too that um, uh, Al Faber had joined, has now joined the CAMI board uh, of directors and I, I, I hope continues to kind of push us to, um, to the rigor of what Baldrige does as well. I think there'll be some nice learnings that we get from that approach. But, um, you know, I, I think we've got a few minutes for some questions and uh, Al, I'll kind of, uh, you know, uh, ask you, you know, has any come through the chat so far? Uh, we've actually had a number of them. So the first one is gonna to go to Rulin. Rulin, human activity is often compared to a pendulum. When we swing too far one way, there is an opposite reaction to swing too far the other way. As healthcare adjusts to the environment, what are the hazards of the pendulum swing and how can healthcare executives be prepared for that? Yeah, so I wasn't really prepared for like real intellectual questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for something where I didn't actually have to think. <laughs> so, um, I, Al, I think it's a fair question. We are, we are seeing 
uh, as digital healthcare becomes more in vogue, where people are going to feel like they can get treated quicker and faster and in their homes and it's easier and it's going to disrupt everything we do. That will only go so far. We will fall back into people to people contact and the pendulum will come back. It will come back more on, on than it has right now on uh, in-person training and classes. Uh, we, we need to, the, the trick for us is it will come back. We will do more in person. We'll never be able to replace that. Uh, it will always have to have some kind of human contact or we're going to go nuts. The, the question then is how do we bridge what we've learned in the pendulum swing to leadership in the future? People want more personal care and they get that when they're one-on-one -on, -one on a computer. When we go back to, to in-person care or in-person training or in-person classes, what can we do to learn from that and to bridge that gap? And that's what leaders should be doing right now. And the leaders that figure that out now, before the pendulum swings back, are going to be the 35% who are prepared for the future. That would be my answer, although that was a stunningly brilliant question. Anthony, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because we're looking at our site visitors who the past year all did the site, all did their visits to programs virtual. And what they're missing is that face-to-face -face contact, that personal contact. I think we're social animals and this kind of going through Zoom video and Teams and everything is, is, is fine and it gets the job done but we still need that personal contact. And I, I, I agree with you. I think um, we're going to move back, but I don't think we're going all the way back to where we were. We'll uh, never go back. I agree with that. It will, it will, we will never go back to know if, if you, if you waited to develop a, a digital strategy until after March of 2020, and you're a health system, you need to be looking who to merge. You waited too long. You blew it. You lost it. You got you to gotta find somebody who was in it way before that. Okay, our next question is going to go to Anthony. We saw earlier that the CAMI study received input from around the globe. Did you see any differences in the importance of competencies around the world as you looked at them? And that, uh, Ooh, that's a good question. Good question, you know. I, I think that the interesting part about that is the sample size. So we really weren't able to compare country to country, but there was, there was one fascinating thing that came up and then I, I don't know if I have a, an explanation for why it happened, but if you were to look at that slide and uh, just as a reminder to everyone, it was, it was the, the top three were um, uh, critical thinking and analysis, leadership management, and communication. Those top three were consistent around the globe. Those were the top three that we kind of saw whether you compared US to other countries or, or in the like. But communications received a far higher percentage in the US than in other places. And so that was the, that was the interesting part. So I, you know, part of me thinks, well, Outside the U.S., is communications really considered part of leadership and management? Or inside the U.S., is communications, does it take on a bigger role? But something about healthcare management in the U.S. Um, and, the, and the leadership kind of position it takes and the skills that's required really kind of make sure that communication becomes a higher priority than in other countries. I don't know the answer to that. I just know... That was the data point that kind of came up. I know, Ruan, you got any, do you have thoughts on why you think U.S. No, might have scored? I, I don't, although I think that's a great question. Um, Anthony and I were talking before the meeting. We are both going to be in Barcelona in November for the International Hospital Federation meetings. And I, I could be something we want to discuss further and with them, and it, it would be very interesting. Also, Al, while I, I have you, I looked at the, some of the Q&As and someone called anonymous attendee 
<laughs> sent to me the, the website for the Health Administration Research Consortium. So on your Q&A, you should have that. I'm expecting it was Dr. Kuntia, who is everywhere all the time. But We'll be sure to get that out to everybody. Um, we do have another question for you, Roland, though. Um, Anthony made a point that the experiences that students received during the COVID-19 might have been better prepared by them ch changing their way of learning. Do you have examples from the University of Colorado that reflect that? Well, yeah, I do. Um, so a year ago, we changed instantly to all online learning. And that went, that, that, that was um, a challenging, it was a challenging process, but the process allowed them to, uh, allowed the students to get on top of the, the, um, this, this new foundational technology. And so when we did that, so that was a year ago in my course, the, one of the courses I teach is the capstone course. It's the final course that the students take. And we try and use that to gain access into organizations. And at least half of those organizations asked my students to take what they had learned in the last four months and help them in their organizations as they tried to learn that, as they tried to share data. There was, there's a clinic that tried to um, learn how to better communicate from point to point to point, and our students had, had learned that. We also had uh, three of our faculty were chaired committees from the International Hospital Federation that were doing COVID research. And so, and they chaired those committees in the summer. I'm trying to get back in my timeline. This almost seems too soon, but so they chaired these committees in the summer of 2020 and had altered their curriculum by the time, based on this research for COVID, based on the time that school started in September. So they had COVID curriculum because of this, these engagements. And I'll tell you nothing, who would have thought that, that going into this a, a year and a half ago, that one of our most critical courses in all of our, our curriculum was supply chain. I mean, that was like a blow off course, right? Yeah. And now all of a sudden it's ruling the world. Yeah. And we've got students who have, gone through supply chain, they know the supply chain questions and answers, and they are instantly important to the industry. You know, Rulon, uh, Cami's working with uh, Reggie Herzlinger, who is uh, considered the, the godmother of, of healthcare innovation, and uh, Gene Schneller from Arizona State University, who is uh, one of the leading authorities on supply chain. And um, and our, our faculty member, by the way. He is. Yes, he is. That's right. Oh, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, both of them really are kind of talking about, you know, how that became so critically important. And, and whether you were looking at, you know, um, masks or, you know, machinery or whatever you needed to get from people, how do you get things from point A to point B? How do you get yeah. back? Yeah, that, that class became really, really important. Really important, yeah. Uh, this last question goes to each of you. And the question is, what are the similarities that you see between Baldridge, Baldridge and CAMI accreditation? Well, I'll say the drive toward alignment of, of purpose. Uh, Baldridge, what Baldridge will do is it will make every, imagine if you work in an organization with 5,000 employees. If I were to take even the senior leadership team, if I took the senior leadership team of that organization with 5,000 employees, and we'll say there's 12 people on that senior leadership team. If I were to ask those 12 people what, uh, what the vision of that organization was, in my experience, less than 20% of organizations, just the senior leadership team could say the same thing, could say that, could, could all identify what that organ, the vision of that organization which is central to where that organization is going. Baldridge will say, will take that as, as you go from the senior leadership team to the whole, to the whole organization, 
as you move from just the senior leadership team to everybody being able to be focused on what you're doing, your organization will improve in every way. That's what Baldrige does for organizations. That's what CAMI does for us, is it drives the, the, the faculty to know what our competencies are, how are we measuring them? We are gonna ask our students about that. We're gonna ask our- And so my fellow Americans, Wow. <laughs> gave me a lot of credit right then. There you go. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and CAMI does that same thing. It drives the whole organization toward that. Faculty, students, um, alumni, business partners, everybody. Ruan, I want to agree with you with that, and I want to focus on one particular area, which you talked about quality improvement. And I, and I think if you go to be a Baldridge organization or you go to become a CAMI accredited program, if you're doing that just to get the brand after your name, just to get that logo that you're Baldridge or you're CAMI, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. You do both organizations because you want to improve quality, you want to get better, and you really want to improve your processes. And I think uh, that's where both organizations, I think, are, are incredibly similar. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I would like to do is first thank both Rulin and Anthony for such an engaging presentation today. As a reminder to everybody, and a few of you have asked, this presentation was recorded and it will be posted along with the slides to the Institute for Performance Excellence website next week. Please watch for a follow-up email, which will also contain a link to the webinar. While you're on the Institute website, please be sure to take a look at our online self-paced certification courses and additional resources to elevate your performance, like those from our partner, the Synergy Organization, who are nationally recognized experts in executive selection and have presented their predictive analytics research findings of Baldridge CEOs at the Quest Conference and ACHE Congress. I'd like to thank our sponsors and our donors, especially the Institute trustees who are members of the Mac Baldridge Society and whose generous support allows us to bring engaging and thought leading webinars like today's presentation to our audiences. Thanks again to all of you for attending today. Please be safe and enjoy the rest of your week.